So I am praying that in the name of Jesus, your heart be open to learn, your heart be open to receive. I'm teaching tonight from Isaiah chapter 2 and verse 2, the mountain of the Lord's house. The mountain of the Lord's house. We'll consider a few things from scripture and then we'll have some time to pray. Can you pray in the spirit for one minute while you prepare your heart to receive the mountain of the Lord's house? Are you praying? Just for a minute or two to set the atmosphere, prepare your heart to listen and to learn the mountain of the Lord's house. Hallelujah. Isaiah chapter 2 from verse 2 to 3. Now from a contextual standpoint, that there are three essential layers to scripture. There is a historic stroke archaeological layer. There is the doctrinal slash contextual layer. And then there is the prophetic layer. The historic archaeological layer connects you to the history of that happening as far as the cultural context is concerned so that you will gain perspective on what uh, the mind of the people that this was written about. And then there is a doctrinal slash contextual meaning. That means you will have to study the text before and after to get a holistic picture of what God through the prophet was communicating here. But then there is the prophetic meaning and that sometimes may deviate completely even from the doctrinal meaning. However, it is still consistent uh, with how God operates and you can draw forth prophetic meanings out of scripture that edify you. An example of such is Isaiah chapter 61. We call it in theology the messianic prophecy. Same Isaiah prophesied and this whole 1 to 4 of Isaiah 61 was speaking about Jesus. Now today believers read it and it applies to us prophetically. But contextually and theologically speaking, he was not talking to us. Are we together? Theologically speaking, he, when he spoke in Genesis chapter 12, he was speaking to Abraham and his seed. But now, giving it a prophetic meaning, we know that that seed, all the while we thought that that seed was Isaac because he was, um, he was said by scripture to be the son of promise. So we thought that the prophecy was for Abraham and his son of promise Isaac but Jesus came and then the, the apostles came and began to tell us that that seed that was referred to in the Old Testament was not Isaac but Jesus and that through Jesus all believers now can be partakers of the blessings that were spoken upon Abraham Galatians 3 29 and if ye be Christ he says then are ye Abraham's seed and heirs according to to the promise so let's go back to Isaiah chapter 2 and verse 2 we're reading 2 and 3 and it shall come to pass in the last days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established in the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills and all nations how many nations all nations the word nations there does not just mean in terms of nationality, it also means people groups of all sorts. Are we together? All nations shall flow to it. Verse 3. And many people shall go and say, Come ye, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, and he will teach us of his ways, and we will walk in his paths. It says, for out of Zion shall go forth the law, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. Hallelujah. So the Bible tells us, uh, you want to get a, even, in fact, let's look at Daniel chapter 2. Daniel 2, 44. It just came to my spirit. This connects with the the statement that Daniel made that in the days of these kings, he was interpreting the king's dream, shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom 
which shall never be destroyed and the kingdom shall not be left to another people but it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms and that kingdom shall stand forever say loud amen, amen. so prophetically speaking this is a, a scripture that describes the end time church it is a scripture that this that describes a time in the church age where God's people, his church, his program will be so built and exalted with stature and power. The Bible says that the move of the spirit, the manifestation of the light and the hand of God upon the church will be so visible, so glaring, so inviting that many nations, many people groups, it will become a center point of attraction that people from all walks of life, people from all nationalities will want to come and be part of what God is doing. It is a prophetic picture of the end time revival. It is a prophetic picture of the days of his power. It is a prophetic picture of the bride of Christ, the church of the Lord rising in her full strength. The clearest picture of the end time church. I have taught you that the end time church represents many things. Among them, the church, generally speaking, that number one, the church represents a strategy. Remember that teaching? That it is God's strategy, the only strategy mandated. It says, thou art my battle axe, my weapon of war. Number two, I told you that the church represents a community of believers. People who are obedient to the faith with Jesus Christ himself being the head of the church. But now, number three, the church also represents an institution. An institution, the only institution mandated and authorized by God. Where you come and learn God, you experience his power, you experience his ways. And it is in this context that I'm teaching tonight. Hallelujah. So... Isaiah chapter 2, you also find that in Micah chapter 4, it tells us that in the last days, the mountain, mountains in scripture represent um, authorities, dominions, kingdoms, that it shall be exalted above every other mountain. Are we together? And that the nations will flow to it. Now, Luke chapter 14. Jesus in the New Testament gave us a very interesting parable that, that attempts to give us a picture of God's intention as far as, as in gathering and the influx of lives, of souls, of people to be blessed by the church is concerned. Luke chapter 14. We'll begin our reading from verse 15. Please give us NIV for this reading. NIV. Um, the reason is because when you read this whole story in KJV, it has a lot of old, you know, old translations and sometimes you will not understand the language. But I read from verse 15 and I want you to follow very carefully. Jesus is speaking now. When one of those at the table with him heard this, he said unto Jesus, Blessed is the man who will eat at the feast in the kingdom of God. 16. And Jesus replied, a certain man was preparing a great banquet, follow carefully, and invited many guests. At the time of the banquet, he sent his servant to tell those who had been invited, come for everything is now ready. 18. But they all alike began to make excuses. Pay attention now. So he's prepared a banquet. A feast of fat things and he instructed his servant to go and bring people that they may come and enjoy all that he has put in place are we together and the Bible says they began to make excuses the first said I have just bought a field and I must go and see it please excuse me number two the second person said I have just bought five yoke of oxen and I'm on my way to go and try them out. Please excuse me. The third person now said, I just got married, so I can't come. Please excuse me. Are we together? Then the servant came back and reported to his master, 
And the owner of the house became angry and he ordered his servant, watch the instruction. He says, go out quickly into the streets and alleys of the town and bring in the poor, bring in the crippled, bring in the blind and bring in the lame. 22. Sir, the servant said, what you ordered has been done. He said, but there is still room. I have brought all the people you asked me to go and bring. But in this house and as touching this feast and this banquet you have prepared, there is still room. And then he said, verse 23, the master told his servant, he said, go out to the roads and the country lanes and make them come in. Amplified says, compel them to come in. It's from the Greek word anakazo, compel them to come in so that my house shall be filled so that my house shall be filled so follow this story carefully Jesus is giving a story here and he says that a man prepared a banquet take notes now Jesus is revealing in this story that it is evil to invite people to come into a place for a banquet where it is not prepared. Are you seeing that the first thing that happened was not an invitation? The first thing that happened was to ensure that all things were ready. Are we together? That, that if the people did respond to that call, they would not come and meet a disappointment. This is a very powerful revelation because the profit of ingathering is that we stay with God and obtain grace to be sure that when the nations flow and come to us, there is something of substance, there is something of grace that we can communicate to them. It is a dangerous and painful thing when the nations rush to Jesus based on the proposition of the church they leave their idols, they leave their vain works, and then they come to the church and there is nothing of substance to give them. The Bible says the character of the end time church will be such that before the grace for ingathering is poured out, the first thing that needs to be done is that there must be a feast, the banquet, everything must be put in place. And then afterwards, he will now empower the people and with confidence he will gather whether the lepers, whether the weak people, because until that time, notice, the three excuses that the people gave in that parable were all valid excuses. Are we together? There was none of the excuses. Give us that scripture again. Luke 14. There was none of the excuses. The Bible says, let's go to verse 18. Watch this. Follow carefully. I'm trying to establish something. The first one said, I have bought a piece of ground. That sounds like responsibility. Do you know what that means? Everybody you are going to bring to the faith life, you will most likely find them doing other things that they find valuable. You will have to give them a message and a proposition that is more compelling than what they consider valuable. This guy has bought a ground, a piece of ground. So if you come to tell him, come for the feast is ready, he considers what he's doing more important, more valuable, and more profiting. In his mind, he thinks it is a stupid thing to leave your field, to go and attend some feast somewhere. So he says, excuse me. Excuse number two, verse 19. The other one said, I just bought five yoke of oxen. In those days, they used the oxen to plow the land. Agriculture was the mainstay of that day. Are we together now? Yes. This will be likened to what you may call, well, agriculture in our day, but say oil and gas, something that you know that was really very, how do you tell a man who has just bought five yoke of oxen to leave everything and come that all feasts are ready? And then number three, he said, I just married. Leave me alone. Are we together? I don't know what can happen there. I'm not ready to go and die and lose my family. You are calling me for a dinner and I just got married. Valid excuses. Listen, this is not just a parable. It is one of the major revelations as to why many people are not coming to the house of the Lord. 
that these people before the church arrived with our evangelism message, many of them were doing responsible things, whether it was wrongly so or rightly so. There was something that defined their passions, something that defined their pursuit. And so when we now come with a message and tell the person, leave your job and go to the field, leave this and go to the field, they keep giving excuses because the propositions we are bringing does not have any worth beyond what they are doing. Until you present a Jesus, a context of Jesus that becomes greater than a man's need, greater than a man's ambition, greater than a man's tea and bread, whatever it is. And let me tell you the truth. Nobody will run to a God or a religion or a faith practice that seems to depreciate them, seems to bring them down. Are we together? That they lose their sense of purpose. They lose their sense of joy. They lose family. They lose intelligence. You know that the context of the Christian faith that is being sold to the nations has misrepresented Jesus because in a bid to bring messages like surrender and the rest, sometimes the imbalance is that we propose a Jesus that is not interested in any other thing about your life. The, and every day he's rolling around in church, no school fees for his children, not taking care of his family. And the wife says, what kind of a Jesus are you marketing? Are we together? All these men had valid excuses. One said, I just bought a piece of property. I'm a responsible person. I'm building an inheritance for my children's children. Don't bring any religious fanatism and deceive me into creating a, a destiny of pain for my children. Excuse me. Another person will say, listen, I'm plowing the land because I do not want my family to be hungry in the name of loving Jesus. Excuse me. The third person said, no, 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 no. I need continuity. I don't know what spirit of death has plagued my family. Now I'm married. Let me be able to have children. Don't come and bring any fanatism that destroys my potential for continuity. And the Bible says when he heard that, he never said the people were wrong. He was angry and pained in his heart. He said, now you go to the street. Go and bring ordinary people who seem to be hopeless, seem to be visionless. Are you noticing? that there were a kind of people that refused to come to that feast. The major people who came to that feast were people who were dejected. This is the reason why in most cases, many people think religion, especially within the context of Africa, was just a system to enslave people and throw people because the, the narrative of Jesus that has been sold is not a balanced narrative. And so there are people who feel it is a waste of their destiny to come to Jesus. Are we together now? Yes. Notice, as soon as he met the lepers, the blind, the lame, with speed they came to eat. Are we together? When you tell a blind man, when you tell a lame man, when you tell a crippled man that they have prepared a feast, number one, they do not believe they are worthy to be in that dinner because of their condition and now when you have proposed a Jesus to them that he's able to meet your need and regardless what you have there is still room for you at the cross they came without complaining but the Bible says there was still room there was space that was created there and it says go to the highways and the byways he said use whatever strategy is within your power to compel them to come Jesus is teaching that means there is a dimension of the ingathering, the fulfillment of this prophecy that will happen by compelling people. The word compel is not just the word force against your will. To compel means to give you an evidence. Are we together? To present before you an evidence that swallows up every excuse that you have. That God has mandated the end time church that if we desire to see souls saved and lives transformed, we need to present an evidence before the nations that can make a businessman, a poor man, an unbeliever, a habali see Jesus as a more superior alternative. If that does not happen, our soul winning adventure will only become an exercise in futility 
and will leave us frustrated. Now I say this with all due respect to all our missionaries and mission agencies. I have studied the role of missionaries and what mission agencies have done across the globe and I commend them for what they have done but I submit to you by the authority of scripture that for so many people the ratio of effort the ratio of the things that missionaries lay down versus the amount of souls that come does not match I can tell you sincerely hallelujah that means that there is something wrong with our overall understanding of the presentation of the end time church there is a context of jesus there is a context of god we have not yet presented to the nations because the bible says where the carcasses are it says there the eagle will gather am i right on that humans were designed by god to not ignore results humans were designed by god that it is important possible to see something that has an overall profit to your life and ignore it you apply for you you tell graduates to apply for a job a job that might be needing just 40 people and you can find over 20,000 people apply why because they consider that that job can be their connection point to living a life of meaning to start earning human beings listen please human beings are and a sense of purpose and this must not be downplayed just because we are preaching Jesus there must be the profit point of following Jesus whilst it is not the major reason for following him it is impossible to sell a Jesus to the nations that has no profit point in their life and expect people to lay down their entire lives and even die for him it is impossible the disciples came to Jesus this frustration did not just start with our world. The disciples came to Jesus and said, listen, listen, we have left everything to follow you. We have left, you claim that you are God incarnate. We left our businesses. Peter left fishing. The disciples left so many things. We have left all to follow you. In all of our discussions, you have not told us our gain and our profiting in following you. You would think Jesus would say you are such stupid, selfish people. Look at what he said. Verse 28. Jesus said that who he that has followed me, Matthew's synoptic account now says, in the generation when the Son of Man shall sit at the throne of his glory, ye shall also sit upon twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. This is one synoptic account. Another one will say, the person who has followed me in this life, he will receive a hundredfold of this and that with persecution and in the world to come. Life everlasting. I have investigated why many people may not seem to be drawn to the things of God. Why is it that it is difficult for revival to happen? The global awakening, is it so hard to preach the gospel? What about the communication of the faith life is hard? And I found out that there is something wrong with the kind of Jesus we are selling to the nations. There is a context of Jesus respectfully speaking that has impoverished africa is brought africa as a nation down it, there are many people today who with all due respect it looks like their lives were better off as non-christians before they became christians because as non-christians even though they were not saved they were a lot more responsible than church has made them now and there are witnesses who can compare before or after and say all you have become now is a greater fanatic with no results to show as far as following Jesus is concerned. As an idol worshipper, they say, you seem to have been a better father. As an idol worshipper, you seem to have been a more responsible person because if you are not responsible, the altars will judge you immediately. You will wake up with headache and noise, the gods warning you. But now you have come into a faith life and it looks like it has sold you a narrative that you are loving Jesus at the expense of your children, loving Jesus at the expense of your life, the continuity of your life. So when you look at the average believer, his life is not a good testimony. The average Christian family, the only consolation to many people is heaven. Are we together now? The Bible says the mountain of the Lord's house shall be exalted 
and there will be a kind of teaching that will come from that mountain and when other people start hearing it they will call themselves and say this is what we are looking for there is something we have been looking for for years for decades finally we have found it come let us go to the mount of the lord by themselves to the house of the god of jacob there is something we have found there and i'm praying in the name of jesus that may we be the generation that will compel the world to come to jesus that we will present such evidence that will make a businessman know he needs Jesus. A president of a nation know that he needs Jesus. An ordinary man, the feast was for everybody. But out of all of them, there were three groups there. The group of wealthy and successful people. The group of poor and dejected people. And then all other people. Only one out of the three groups came to respond to that call. The first group that Jesus called, they were too busy as professionals. All of the groups, the one who was in real estate, the one who was in agriculture, the one who just married, they had things that they considered to be useful. And since we are not going to present a Jesus that can be useful to that kind of life, they threw everything away and said, I'm sorry. Then they said, go to the poor. Bring the poor, bring the blind. Bring the lame. I hope you know that the reason why the poor and the blind and the lame came was simply because they knew that they were already left for dead. So it was a privilege for them to be part of that banquet. But the, the master was angry and he said, you know what? I'm going to give you another mandate. Go to the street. This banquet is for everybody, not just for the rich not just for the poor it is for everybody but i am placing something upon you that with it you will go and compel everyone to come in that my house may be filled ladies and gentlemen the church of the lord jesus christ even the end time church is an institution and a place where nations must come to experience the true living God. The end time church is a platform and institution where nations must come and experience the true living God. Please write that statement. The true living God. We lift up the name of Jesus in praise and worship. We lift up the name of Jesus as we shout him to the nations. But you see, the fact that the nations have not been compelled to turn aside and say, what are these people saying? We need to go back and re-examine the kind of Jesus we are presenting to the nation. The kind of Jesus we are selling to the nations. Because I can tell you, based on the parable that Jesus gave, the kingdom and church is not just for poor, dejected frustrated people and I, I don't mean any disrespect but you will find out that in most parts of Africa those who seem to be the most religious people are largely those who may have failed with their lives and there is no sense of purpose or destiny and when you tell them come they just come because at least I, I after all I was already on my way dying but those who shape culture those who rewrite the narratives of every civilization, the kind of Jesus we have proposed to them, they are not interested at all. And do you know, you can have one million weak people say yes to Jesus, but in the presence of one of this first group of people who say no to Jesus, you will still subject the purposes of God. These have been my contemplations for a long time. And now watch what I'm about to show you. I found out that there are at least, written up in scripture, there are about five representations of the one true God that the church must present to the world if we want to see an ingathering, a prophetic global ingathering of kings, of mean men, of weak people, of ordinary people. There are five presentations of Jesus or God Almighty until we are able to market this kind of God to the world. Forget about the world, leaving what they are doing and coming into the faith experience. Are you ready? The Bible tells us in Psalm 103, 
and please pay attention as I discuss it now. It says, bless the Lord, O my soul. Give it to us, please. And all that is within me, bless his holy name. Verse 2. It says, bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not his benefits. This is a very profound scripture. In presenting God, he's saying that there are benefits that God has. There are benefits. When you come to him, you come because you love him. But he's not just calling you to come and waste your time. There is a feast that has been prepared. Are we together now? He's calling you into a heavenly banquet. He's calling you to live your life, your old ways, into an experience that has benefits. Benefit number one. Verse 3, the Bible says, Who forgiveth all thine iniquities. This is the first presentation of God that we must bring to the nations. The God who forgives. The world will never come to your God until you present him as a God who forgives, as an expression of his love. The nations, let me tell you the truth, the average person across the globe, they, they have, once you have become an adult in today's world, you most likely have been full of stories that represent pain, betrayal, all sorts of things. It is important that we present to the nation the God who loves and the God who forgives. Two scriptures. Number one. Daniel chapter 9 and verse 9. In fact, we'll look at more than two scriptures. Jesus Christ is the Hallelion of Israel. Jesus Christ, you are the Hallelion of Israel. Jesus Christ, the Hallelion of Israel. The Bible says, to the Lord our God, belonged mercies and forgiveness though we have rebelled against him that this God that we present to the nations even though the people he's calling were until their salvation experience rebels that this God who is calling them has forgiveness to offer unto them Acts chapter 13 and verse 8 Acts 13 and verse 8 did I get that right? Oh dear, I think I've lost something now. Psalm 130, let's look at Psalm 130, 1 to 8. Look at this profound scripture. Psalm 131 to 8. Out of the depths I have cried unto thee, O Lord. Verse 2. It says, Lord, hear my voice. Let thine ears be attentive to the voice of my supplication. Verse 3. It says, If thou, O Lord, shouldest mark iniquity, O Lord, who shall stand but there is forgiveness with thee that thou mightest be feared reading to verse 8 I wait for the Lord my soul doth wait and in his word do I hope verse 6 it says my soul waited for the Lord more than they that watch for the morning I say more than they that watch for the morning 7 let Israel hope in the Lord for with the Lord there is mercy and with him is plenteous redemption verse 8 and he shall redeem Israel from all his iniquities this is the first representation of God that the end time church must present to the nations the God who forgives Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 7 Paul puts it profoundly 1 7 in whom we have redemption through his blood he says the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace Apostle, are you saying no matter how far I've gone from God, deviated from the things of God, that there is hope for me when I come to him? This is the proposition of the end time church, that we are a place, a platform, an institution that must market and sell a God that loves men enough to forgive their sins. Jeremiah 31, I believe, and verse 3, is it? That I have loved thee with an everlasting love therefore with my loving kindness have i drawn you hallelujah for as long as we look at the world and point hands at them and continue to make them believe that there is no redemption for them 
then once we are done saying we tell them come they will never come they need the presentation of a God who loves them and forgives them not a God who condones sin but the Lord who loves them beyond that condition and seeks to remedy that condition are we together that's why he sends Jesus can I tell you a forgiving God is a God worth coming to let me repeat myself again. A forgiving God is a God worth coming to because forgiveness is a scarce thing in our world. Men are designed for vengeance. Men are designed for all kinds of things. In fact, one of the, one of the foundational propositions of witchcraft is revenge and vengeance by all means. Are we together now? Yeah. So if someone steals something, you don't need to investigate who stole it. You just go and meet a herbalist and say whoever stole this right now, let his stomach begin to swell or let something happen to him or whatever. Let him start shouting as a madman to confess. Do you think someone will want to leave that herbalist in this wicked world? No, they will stay with that herbalist and say just to let you know they've stolen something. Can you help me and kill whoever has done so? We present to the world as an end time church a forgiving God not a condoning God please do not misunderstand me not a condoning God but a forgiving God that we can come before the throne of grace anybody at all regardless what you have done and you see when it has to do with the subject of sin and iniquity the Bible's conclusion according to Romans 3 I believe verse 23 is that all have sinned all have sinned all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of god all have sinned. in fact there is a version that says all have sinned by nature and in practice so whichever you cannot escape by nature in sin did my mother and for if for any reason you were born by somebody who did not sin in practice hallelujah I will search for you and I will find you I will find you with all my heart I will search for you and I will find you I will find you with all my heart listen do you know how good this news is when you tell someone who believes He's been condemned, looking at his life. Your entire life is rotten, wasted. You are no good for yourself. Perhaps a child that he is not aware of how I've lived my life and what I have done. Even God, if he knows my case, you say you are different. And you tell him, no. When Jesus hung upon that cross, it was love that kept him there. Not ignorance. It was not ignorance of your condition that made him to die. He was fully aware of the extent of your fall, yet he still died. Are we together? The world will only come to a God who forgives, not who condones. Teaching a God that condones everything is another kind of error. God is mighty, God is holy, God is great but he's also loving. Ladies and gentlemen, when you taste of the love of Jesus, fear dies permanently in your life. Are we together now? Fear dies in your life. There are people who cannot serve God today. They cannot serve God acceptably. They cannot live for Jesus today. Are we together now? Is the reason why the moment, do you know that there are many people who come to Jesus because it's like a bribery with their lives until they become blessed. So their commitment in church and their commitment to Jesus is not because they are aware he loves them. It's out of fear. Now that my life does not have anything to show, if he decides to be angry with me, I'm in trouble. So let me just pamper him with praise and worship. Pamper him with my tithe and offering, hoping that I rise when I become like one of those men, the one who married, the one who bought yokes of oxen, or the one who has now bought real estate. I now officially divorce him and say, Thou Jesus, don't come around my life again. I am now a rich man. I do not need you. Let the poor and beggars continue with you. But there is God who forgives. There is God who forgives. 
He can forgive the sins of the fathers. The idolatry that we were all born into, he can forgive. I know that people were killed, he can forgive. I know that wrong covenants were done, he can forgive. I know that altars, missionaries were killed, but that God can forgive. And we are presenting to the world a God who forgives. That it is true that God can drive a man's sin. You were born by whatever means. You were born from a family. Your father or yourself may have lived your life anyhow. Let me tell you the truth. If it is the God of the Bible, he does not condone sin, but he's loving enough to forgive. He can forgive. He can forgive. If God were to count iniquity, the Bible says who shall stand, whether by nature or by practice the conclusion is that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God now you sell this kind of message to someone do you know that even great people think about their lives and they say I may have all this money I may have all these things remember my teaching on the rich young ruler the guy had everything the world could offer but he came to him and he said good master there is something I'm looking for that my money cannot buy it is called eternal life what must I do to inherit eternal life I know what I must do to be rich I know what I must do to be influential I am a rich young ruler but I do not know what I need to do to have eternal life when it has to do with eternal life it is a gift for the great it is a gift for the small it is a gift for the educated it is a gift for the uneducated it is for all men John 3 16 says for God so loved the world not just a group of people he gave his one only begotten son that whosoever this blessing is for whosoever who believes in him should not perish the bible says but have life eternal can i tell you i will never present a jesus that looks like he zipped his heart as far as forgiveness is concerned provided any man is alive on earth even if it is five minutes to the end of your days whoever your you are once your heart is sincere admitting your condition and confessing his lordship the bible says he is able to save savior he can move a mountain my god is mighty to save he is mighty to save forever the author of salvation he rose and conquered the grave jesus conquered the grave by the grace of god in this ministry we have seen all kinds of people saved people who at the point where you saw them you would if you were to assess them you would say these ones even jesus will reject them but he received them and look how he's turned their lives today many of them serving the lord with power and grace when you know who jesus is and you know the kind of god the end time church should present to the world you will never look at anybody alive and conclude on them because you may be concluding on saul whereas the person you are concluding on because she's a prostitute because she's a drunkard God does not condone sin but ladies and gentlemen his heart is loving enough and in this end time before Jesus comes can I tell you the gates of the church will be open and will receive strange kind of people and you will see the mighty men that will come out of those people some of the people who will come are people who have all their life been in witchcraft and idolatry but they will come and be found and cleaned by the word of God and out of those people prophets will arise out of those people evangelists will arise and their witness will be stronger and some of them hear me it may be your children maybe your son who you do not even know where he is right now you don't know whether he's in Nigeria or whether he's abroad you've been pain wondering oh God can you save this child when you know this about the God who forgives there is nobody you cannot intercede for and then you are careful when you conclude on men because if God is not done with them then it is not done are we together the mountain of the Lord's house is open for all nations because and will receive of all nations coming to it because we are revealing a God who forgives yes sir he can forgive your grandfather killed people all his life but he can forgive 
sacrifice animals to idols, he can forgive. With incisions all around your body, he can still forgive. God does not condone, but he can forgive. He can abundantly pardon. He can abundantly pardon. Let the nations hear this. That the Jesus that we present is one who is seated on the throne of righteousness and justice. But I want you to know that he's not only a lion, he's a lamb. And the Bible says, worthy is the lamb that has been slain for us. We are standing here today because we are beneficiaries of his forgiveness, his mercy. We are able to approach the throne of grace to find mercy and to find help even in time of need. Believers, hear me. The Bible says if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, that God is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. There is a message that the businessman is waiting for. There is a message that the president of a nation, after bribing for 10 years, is waiting for. When you tell them there is a God who can forgive. A family that has oppressed somebody for 20 years, and you still tell them, once your heart is broken. Listen to my message on mercy. God does not forgive rebels. Let me repeat. God does not forgive rebels. There is a condition to receive forgiveness from God. That condition is called brokenness and repentance. Once you are not broken and repentant, forgiveness is not for you. So let me balance it. Forgiveness is not a license to blackmail God and remain in your state. Forgiveness only answers to genuine brokenness and repentance. Without brokenness and repentance, forgiveness is useless. This is not only true for God, it's also true for men. When you say, tell somebody, I forgive you, and the person is not broken and repentant, you only wasted your time. What you need to say is, I tolerate you, not I forgive you. Tolerance, I have taught you, is creating accommodation for an obvious limitation that will repeat itself again. Forgiveness, on the other hand, answers to genuine brokenness genuine brokenness a broken and a contrite heart oh god thou will not despise hallelujah but the first dimension of god that we must reveal to the nations as the end time church is the god who forgives please say the god who forgives one more time say the god who forgives number two very quickly the god who heals the second benefit that will bait the nations to come to him because he gave us a mandate to go and compel them. If we are going to compel the nations to come to God, we must be able to present to them a God who heals. Follow carefully. Jeremiah 17, 14. A God who heals. Heal me, O Lord, and I shall be healed. He says, save me and I shall be saved, for thou art my praise. Heal me, O Lord. Matthew 9, 35. A healing God, my goodness. Matthew 9, 35. And Jesus went about all the cities and villages, watch this, teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing every sickness and every disease among the people. Listen, I can tell you this by the authority of scripture. This is one of the greatest systems of compulsion that will bring the nations to Jesus before he returns, the healing ministry. Because when it has to do with sickness, no amount of money by itself can immune you from it. Money can give you a greater house, can give you security, but with all that financial, the financial resources, they can diagnose you of cancer, diagnose you of whatever it is. I can tell you, when the church presents a healing Jesus with proof, this one will win more souls to Jesus than you have ever seen. 
our fathers, the patriarchs prophesied that before Jesus returns, the healing ministry will be restored. You've heard me cry the healing ministry. I'm saying that because there are people you are seated here and God is saying, hear this preacher because now this is where it applies to you. I've not been training you for nothing. You've not been fasting for nothing. You've not been doing night vigils for nothing. I am building you in the spirit because the healing anointing that I can tell you that you have not seen anything yet as far as the healing ministry of the church is concerned the healing Jesus the one who can heal who does not want to live long who does not want to fulfill his days and do you know sickness is so terrible that the moment it manifests in your body it shuts down every other activity it can redefine your priority in a moment you can be preparing for a business and then they tell you you have cancer or you have something you need to run to the hospital now your plans will change immediately ladies and gentlemen when the church stands in partnership with medical science and we prefer a solution to the world that Jesus can heal HIV not theoretically can heal cancer even stage four not theoretically can heal the blind the deaf the lame with proofs not stage managed proof genuine ever increasing proof i can tell you a day will come when people will stand up and say come and organize a crusade in our territory we will pay for it by ourselves bring that healing jesus we have been looking for a healing jesus and we did not find him for 50 years when you find the healing jesus please tell me about him to the one who is sick you do not need noise. You need a healing Jesus. The reason why our witness is not effective is because those who went before us, although some of them were uneducated, but they were able to present a healing Jesus to the nations. I remember it was T.L. Osborne, I believe, who was sharing that one time he went to a nation and they would not pay attention to him. He preached and preached and preached and preached and they were just looking at him. And when all that noise was done, he made up his mind. He said, you know what? I think, I hope I recall the story well. They brought somebody who was lame out. They brought somebody who was blind out. They brought sick people. And it was, there was difficulty because the people were not really English speaking. As soon as he laid hands on the cripple, laid hands on the blind, and there was a miracle, there was an eruption, people began to shout. Can I tell you, one genuine miracle is equal to a thousand sermons. You believe me when I tell you that. One genuine miracle that someone who is in National Hospital here or any of the FMC seen by everybody, stage four cancer, kalakatosiata, Lord, take us to that realm. Take us to that realm where we stop being noisemakers. Take us to that realm where we present a healing Jesus. Health cannot be bought in the mall. You can buy healthy food. Unfortunately, there is no product called health that is sold in the market. When your body begins to deteriorate, that is when you will know that of all the needs that you have, you need a God that heals. Hallelujah. Hmm. Do you know that one of the major, listen, listen. Out of the prayer requests that are dropped here all the time, and in my, the bit of my experience with, in ministry, if I'm to tell you the five major prayer points of people, five major prayer points of people, for most people, prayer point number one is finance, and finance finance related issues number two is their health issues of health that means by next week over 90 percent of the prayer points that will be dropped here is simply a request healing jesus where are you oh god that heals where are you do you know that when it has to do with the god that healed asians will call him Americans will call him, Nigerians will call him, even a Habalist will still call him. Go and study history, both from the Bible and modern history. Those who won cities to the Lord, they came with a healing God. 
a healing Jesus. After selling the idea that God saves, we need to let people Jesus is that he heals. But can I tell you the truth? As it is now, that banquet of healing is not yet ready by the church. It will be a casualty if we go and call the world now and say, all of you, the blind come, the deaf come. I know we walk by faith, but if we are to be honest now, that feast oh, that part of the menu is not yet ready. It's not yet ready. It's not yet ready. It's not yet ready. Help us, oh God. It's not yet ready. What did these people see? What came upon them? That a woman like Emmy Semfu McPherson, ladies and gentlemen, imagine Koinonia like this. If you are not sick, you were not invited for that program. What a woman. Stretch out only meetings. That means if you are healthy, go home. It was only for sick people. And as they moved down the line, they lifted people as if they were state managing. You would see over 100 wheelchairs wheeling out of conferences imagine you ladies and gentlemen i'm praying for you again in the name of jesus that not only will you be healed but that god is looking for the hands that will present a healing jesus may he find your hand available 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 Hallelujah. I have seen what the healing power of God can do in the midst of men. I have seen what instant healing can do in the midst of men. It will clear doubts in a moment. Reposition your faith in a moment. In every gathering like this, there are always critics, there are doubters, there are scientific Christians, there are all kinds of people. But the moment the power of God is brought to the scene, it brings an end to the discussion. If God sends you back, please don't go until you fast and pray and say, Lord, verify that is not only a message I'm carrying, that the grace to demonstrate that you are alive, let it come upon me too. With all due respect, let me suggest this, particularly to mission agencies. Let's obtain grace from God, not just to carry salmons to the bush. We will keep dying for nothing. It takes more than salmons to cast out devils. We must obtain grace. You enter a village even if they cannot speak English. May God help you. You are, look at our fathers like Apostle Babalola. Was it not raising the dead and all these things that brought them to landlight? Reinhard Bonke in the east when he came. The video is still there till today even though the man has gone to be with the Lord. When the dead was raised, it shot his ministry to another dimension. I had the privilege to be in his crusades. I saw real miracles, not that they told me. My goodness, with one declaration, I saw people stand up from wheelchairs. I saw people fling their crutches, not stage managed. You watch T.L. Osborne's crusades and see miracles that short legs, people came and were limping inches below and with one declaration, those legs grew out. Not some of this jamboree that is happening in the church. Genuine miracles. The end time church must be the church that reveals genuinely the God who heals and you see it will not just be by one person one person's witness of a healing God will not be effective you will overburden that one person till he dies this is why you see pastors collapsing because God never designed for only one or two people it's a grace that should go round and spread round Paul was healing the sick Philip was healing the sick Peter was healing the sick all of them were healing the sick as ye go preach saying the kingdom is at hand proof number one heal the sick proof number one heal the sick anyone here who is called into the healing ministry i'm praying for you 
right now I stretch my hands by the Spirit the anointing and the grace that will lead you to experiences that will build your spirit man until you carry a potent healing anointing may that grace rest upon you now hallelujah let me tell you the truth and this is an honest submission I have seen people healed of all manner of diseases in my life but I must tell you sincerely I've also seen people die of all manner of diseases and as a man of God sometimes you stand and you are pained there are people I have prayed for they have received their miracles and I am delighted but there are still people trusting God you know that there are some of them as you are looking at me like this and all those people some of them keep quoting scripture can I tell you if we fail to present a God who heals, a day will come our churches will be empty. And don't you say it does not matter. You, it does not matter is the deception and carelessness that the devil has brought that reduces us from the standard of power to an intellectual generation. Oh yes, it matters. Oh yes, it matters to present the God that heals. The healing ministry is so desperate in need right now that I can do anything disdainful right now in front of you. If I can convince you that it can heal you, that pride and do it. If I, God forbid, but just as an example, if I bring sand here right now and mix it with water and mix it with whatever, even if I kill an animal and pour the blood there, as ugly and smelly as it is, if I give an instruction, that's to tell you how bankrupt of the healing power. If I tell you this can solve your problem and heal your loved one that is having breast cancer now or having some kind of cancer, you will be amazed. Let one person touch it and let there be real healing. While critics are criticizing, the person will say, let me heal my loved one first. Then I'll go and verify whether it's demonic power or genuine power. Humans for you. Don't downplay the desperation of men. When men are desperate, nobody will want to watch his loved one die and you cannot do anything. You've spent your money and this sickness is eating mama, eating everybody. They are emanciating every day. And yet we keep saying, don't go to the harbor list. And the person just looks at you and says, it's not your fault. Your own mother is alive. Your own father is alive. Your own sisters are alive. There is honorarium after service. My own mother, who is the only person taking care of me, is about to die. If we do not present a God that heals, I repeat, Africa will go back to its vomit. Let me tell you the truth. If we do not present a God that heals, men of God, we must trust God for grace to reduce activities and go back to the secret place and say, Lord, where did we miss it? Where did we miss it? Let that man to return. Oh, let that man to return. What did Kenneth Hagin carry? What did T.L. Osborne carry? What did they carry? Where is the mantle that were upon the apostles that a man was teaching and a woman fell from a story building and died? And they went back, raised the woman back to life and continued the lecture. Kai. It was said of E.W. Kenyon that there was a particular age range that people did not die below. He will raise you back. One time they said a truck crush somebody's feet literally mash the feet like this and all he did was to come and stand in front of it and the bones began to shake until they came back these are not exaggerations listen i had a visit sometimes to bonnie bonnie island and they showed me the pulpit where men like Joseph Johnson, Samuel Ajayi Crowder, one of them, the pulpit that had fire coming out on it, I saw it there and I said, Lord, revive us. We are here bragging, whereas the sick have been sick. There are people watching me right now from several hospitals. We keep proposing a God to the nations they are not interested in. The nation we are reaching is not a dull nation. They need the God that heals. Can you pray in one minute? Father, restore the healing mantle back to the church. Please pray. Restore the healing mantle. Let somebody carry this grace again.
Koinonia pray let's pray on behalf of this ministry let's pray on behalf of the body of Christ the end time church must be the church that presents the God that heals a healing Jesus genuine healings not table healings please pray hallelujah John chapter 6 and verse 2 John chapter 6 and verse 2 so that we stop losing our loved ones through untimely death while we are shouting amen imagine how many sick people go to church we tell them this man of God is powerful Joshua Selman is powerful you just come for koinonia and some of these people take steps of faith some of them even go as far as leaving the hospitals by faith and they come and sit down under us and we come with all our paraphernalia and sometimes with pride and after we are done shouting the people go back like that and we act as if nothing happened may there be a generation that will not will hold on to the hand of God and say Lord restore this healing mantle restore this healing mantle can I tell you it is amazing those we call the champions of healing in our generation our fathers in the Bible and in modern history I'm sure they will weep from heaven and say what a shame this is what you call the healing ministry of praying and shouting and fasting for days and only one person with one unverified headache or someone who says he's healed and we celebrate the testimony here and two days later the person is back in the hospital and the person dies quietly but people keep clapping that the healing has happened genuine healing is genuine healing period John 6-2 you came to grow, to draw from you again, again. Hey. We've come to draw, 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 draw from you again. John 6, 2. Notice, every time you see healing, you see great multitudes. And a great multitude followed him. Europeans, Asians. I say this with all humility to God. Did you know that just preparing for the US conference and the UK conference right now, the last update, there are about 5,600 workers. 5,600 workers. Just for the conference, not those coming. Those who want to work and about 4,000 for Canada. Do you know why? Because when people perceive that God has placed something upon your life, excuses die. Remember the parable I show you? Anytime somebody tells you, excuse me, what he's saying is you've not ascended to a level where you have presented a Jesus for me that makes what I'm doing become inferior. Whereas what I am doing is still superior to your proposition, you will keep hearing, excuse me. Come, let's go to church. Excuse me, I am busy. But not when a healing Jesus is moving. When a healing Jesus is moving, Catherine Kuhlman's crusade that will start 6 a.m. by 5 or by 2 or 3, people were already there joining queues. And a great multitude followed him because they did what? Let's read it together. One to read. And a great multitude followed him. Why? Which he did on them that were diseased. One more time. And a great multitude. Look at this scripture and don't forget it. And a great multitude followed him. He didn't call them. He didn't beg. This is beyond poster. It's beyond social media. When you market a healing Jesus with proof. And men can see him. All excuses die. We leave Nigeria to India because we want to take patients for surgery. And no matter how long the flight is, it is not too long, provided an attempt can be made to restore their lives. 
we live from here to America, from here to Canada, to Europe. We are we, because we have patients that need to be. There are people who are carried literally. Oh, my spirit is fired up. In the name of Jesus Christ, the Son of the Living God, may God restore this healing mantle. Yeah. Let me share with you something that happened. I'm not one person who brags around encounters because I want people to build their faith in the word. But many years ago, I had a vision. And in that vision, this man comes to me, not too tall, and I'm looking at him. And then we have this conversation. It's a spirit communication. And when he's done, it was like an impartation that came from him. And then I looked at him and I said, Sir, what is your name? And he did not answer me. He just kept moving. Then later he turned to me and he said, Paul. And I said, Paul. Paul in the Bible. That was when it occurred to me. These guys, they are called, this is not just some witchcraft. They are called the spirits of just men made perfect. I believe that in these days, some of you will go to the place of prayer and there are saints like Elijah and um, Elijah and, and, and Moses appeared before Jesus. There are saints who will come and say, sit down. Let me tell you what happened in the 1920s. There are mantles that came upon us. Hear me. The many sermons that we preach today, I submit to you, not as a way of condemning the church, the many volumes of sermons that we bring to convince members is because of the bankruptcy of a healing Jesus. The gospel was supposed to be simple and penetrative in the presence of results. Great multitudes followed him because they saw what he did on them that were diseased. Because they saw, because they saw in Koinonia, because they saw everywhere. Do you know, every time I pray preparing for administration, among the many things I say, oh God of heaven. Now we are going to Kenya in a few days and I'm saying, Lord, thank God for the mighty things you did last week. But there are people traveling from everywhere. Father, we pray like the apostles prayed that you stretch forth your hands and that miracle signs and wonders be wrought in the name of your holy son. You are a man of God here. I'm showing you the end time strategy to run away from frustration. There will be empty pews for anybody who cannot reveal a healing Jesus. Thank God for emotional healing. That is important. But we are talking of healing of bodies deteriorated. I understand why they hated Jesus. Because they had given a narrative that God did not heal again. Suddenly this Galilean shows up. He looks at a woman who had been bound 18 years. And he says, woman, you are delivered from all your infirmities. He goes in John 5, sees a man who had been 30. Imagine coming to meet a popular crippled man in Abuja. And say, where is the man? Imagine some popular person who is deaf or blind or whatever that you are aware of. Do you know what would have happened that Naaman returned back? Naaman returned back and they said, sir, what happened to you? I met a prophet in Israel called Elisha. He would not even let me see his face. He only said he represented the God of heaven. And he said I should go and watch seven times. All this fight about churches and membership. Is simply because we are not carrying genuine grace. There are enough members, enough sinners, enough people in trouble to fill every church plus overflows. If you present a God that heals. One more time, don't be tired. This is koinonia. Lay your hands on your head and say, Lord, as you are anointing men in this end time to heal, I pray that I will be an available vessel. Go ahead and pray. Salike paresco franda gabarakasco brende gelegus. Krate kafaraske belende gerusia. Go to the highways and the byways and compel them to come by presenting a God that loves and compel them to come by presenting a God that forgives and compel them to come by presenting a God that heals. Hallelujah. Please be seated. Let me give you number three. What kind of God must we present to the nations 
to cause the nations to come as a multitude to him. Number three, the God who redeems and delivers. The God who redeems and delivers. The God who redeemed and delivers. Psalm 50 verse 5. Let's hurry up. Psalm 50 verse 5. I just sense that very soon the waters in this place will be steered. Honestly, I sense that we have taught something in the spirit and there is a baptism that God wants to do before this service is done today. And I want you to position your heart. The God who delivers. Hallelujah. Psalm 50 verse 15, not 5, 15. Psalm 50 verse 15, please. Let's hurry up, media. Let's read together. One, two, read. And call upon me in the day of trouble. Uh-huh. And I will deliver thee, and thou shalt glorify me. Psalm 34 verse 4. The God who delivers. I have taught you that deliverance is a process that brings separation between you and any unclean spirit or between you and any fav unfavorable condition. Deliverance is not limited to separation from spirits. You can be delivered from a condition. Psalm 34 and verse 4. I sought the Lord and he heard me. How did he prove he had heard me? He delivered me, not from all my trouble, from all my fears. A man can be delivered from the things that bring fear. I believe in deliverance. Hold some deliverance. Casting out the spirit influence and the condition that keeps God's people down and then preaching and reorienting their understanding. Deliverance through transformation and then supplying the grace that helps them to conform to the image of the Christ in experience. This is wholesome deliverance. Luke chapter 4 and verse 18. When Jesus was reading the Messianic prophecy, here's what he had to say. That he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor and hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted and preach deliverance to the captives. In every congregation there are captives. Look at the kind of people that constitute the membership in every church. The word poor there is also the word meek or limited people. So you find poor people, there are broken hearted people, there are captives, there are spiritually blind people, there are those who are bruised. Every time you see members come together, look beyond the clothes they are wearing. This is a spiritual x-ray of the people who come to our churches every week. Make sure you do not ignore the captives because you have not contended for genuine power. It says upon Mount Zion there shall be deliverance and holiness and the sons of Jacob shall possess their possessions. The God who delivers. Psalm 107 verse 20. Goodness. He sent his word and his word healed them. But there are some people who do not need healing. The word now delivered them, not from spirits, from their destruction. A man can be delivered from destruction, meaning the devil can bind you with destruction. That you get up in the morning and you come out of your house only to return with so much trouble because you were bound with destruction. It says that men can be delivered from destruction. For as long as I am alive, I will preach deliverance and I will minister to people who are bound, even now, that anybody who is under the yoke of any spirit that has trapped your life, has trapped your destiny, in the name that is above all names, I decree and declare, may that spirit leave you now. Can I tell you, it is impossible to have the gathering of people come in the name of Christ and come to the end time church without having one person there who is in need of deliverance. When you are preaching to mature believers who have been mentored by you and you have supervised their spiritual growth, you can guarantee that by the reason of their growth and understanding, they may be free from the influence of these spirits. But in every gathering, God adds daily as many who should be saved. There must be one person in every congregation that needs to experience the deliverance power of God. The separation of light from darkness. 
when people get up with all the nightmares, wrong dreams of seeing yourself in your secondary school. Don't just say it's just a dream and all kinds of, of, of unwise spiritual explanations. What makes you believe that's just a psychological thing? That you find yourself with the dead, you find yourself in a grave, someone hits you in a dream, you wake up with physical pain. After two weeks, they tell you it is cancer and you say that is psychology? Does that sound like psychology? No. The realm of the spirit is real. I know a family, I think I've shared the story here. A whole family, someone came up in a dream according to what they said with a syringe and said this is HIV, HIV virus. Injected the person in a dream and the person woke up, just shrugged it away. After a few weeks, their health began to deteriorate. They went to the hospital with no reason to have caught HIV. They, they diagnosed them and they said they had HIV. Ministry is like medicine. It exposes you to all kinds of people. People and things you would not have believed except that you saw it yourself. How about me, the preacher who is talking to you? You've heard my story that I was born again and I was already walking with God, yet spirits were coming to oppress me. The, uh, maybe because of my spiritual understanding at that time, I didn't think it, I knew it was a disturbing issue, but I didn't think it was such an issue that demanded attention. How do you go? Sometimes I would preach in a meeting and return back. Not many people will be honest to tell you this. I would lie down. And then because of the advantage of the prophetic, I would see these spirits entering my room. I would shout Jesus, the same name that was making demons run away while I was preaching. And these spirits would not run. As if they, I was lying. I knew something was wrong. I'm saying this to you so that you swallow your pride tonight and say this spirit that has been disturbing me I'm not going to be hiding and be lying and say I'm okay simply because I want to show that I'm spiritual it is better to hold on to the horns of the altar and deal with it once and for all before it tears your destiny into pieces listen I'm both old and new school oh. let me tell you I am both old and new school depending on what you are looking at Are we together? Yeah. Both old and new school. Depends on what you are looking at. There are many believers who are going through all kinds of satanic problems. They know it. They will pretend and act as if they do not know it. Things are going bad in your life. You know by intelligence that this is the hand of the devil. You are watching yourself go down. Your family go down. Your ministry go down. Every good thing is leaving you. And you are just smiling and saying, it's all right. I'm sure that it's just a season. A season of what? The day you get angry, that season comes to an end. I'm telling you this. Hallelujah. There are people who have all kinds of physical evidences of the dominion of darkness. I know somebody, true story, who told me that he got money, physical money. He kept it in his house. He was the only person. That money disappeared till forever. I'm not talking of someone came, maybe an arm robber or maybe a cleaner came and stole it. It disappeared. And I know the person is too responsible to be playing games and lying with me. Somebody promises to bless you and you wake up in the morning and you go back to the same person and he says, I cannot, did I ask you to come here? And he said, I sir, I thought you said it's my time to get this job to help my mother. And the person says, so I cannot remember if you ever come here again. And then someone comes and you see what should have been yours. They just tell the person, go and get the job. And you sit down and say, it does not matter. Can I tell you, let me give you a project. Write everything that is not working in your life. Let that become your spiritual project. Take responsibility and say, this is the devil. When you see the signature of Satan, you know. John 10, 10. The thief cometh not but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. What is this pain that I'm having around my body? I went to lie down and the next thing, I saw myself in a coffin. I got up. Yes, there is a place to just make blind declarations. But if warfare were a waste, the Bible will not, will, will not talk about it. Are we together? Yeah. 
there are times where it's not just a blind declaration no god forbid i am fine you need to go and hold on to the horns of the altar satan i am a believer in christ there are benefits to serving god and i'm declaring i am here to appropriate this benefit of deliverance hallelujah benefit of deliverance benefit of deliverance i have taught you you see yourself in a coffin wake up and close that coffin and bury it by yourself are we together no you don't get up and leave the coffin open for what oh grave where is your sting oh death where is your victory in the name of jesus the same spirit that raised christ from the dead lives within me there is no death for me till i finish my assignment and no conspiracy and no divination against me can stand as i travel from nation to nation he suffered no man to do them wrong he reproved kings for their sake saying touch not my anointed and do my prophets no harm i'm showing you how to take dominion listen the church that will see nations come to it must be a church that allows the hand of the spirit to administer deliverance to God's people. It is my prayer and my covenant with God that nobody will come here carrying any strange, wicked, familiar spirit and that spirit sits comfortable, opening prayer, comfortable, praise and worship, comfortable testimonies comfortable then I come up comfortable we share the grace and the spirit escorts you back to continue the trouble no sir no sir our prayer is not a waste the fasting is not a waste in the name of Jesus I'm saying again every spirit that has become a stumbling block upon your life and your destiny by the power that raised Christ from the dead be separated from that spirit now Please sit down. The end time church, if we are to compel sinners and compel men and nations to come to Jesus, it must be the church that reveals the God who redeems, the God who delivers. Number four, let me finish because I want us to pray. The end time church is a church that must be prepared to reveal the God who honors and lifts. You want men to come to Jesus? You must present to the nations and for the nations a God who can honor and a God who can lift. First Chronicles 29, 12. A God who honors. Both riches and honor come from thee. And thou reignest over all. And in thy hand is power and might. And in thy hand it is to make great and give strength to all. I will never sell a weak Jesus who does not seem to be interested in lifting men and in honoring men. Among the many benefits are the, that are the privilege of the saints, there is something called the inheritance of the saints in light. I think that should be Colossians 1 and verse 12 or so. The inheritance of the saints in light. Giving thanks to the Father which has made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. The God who lifts. Psalm 71 verse 21. God gave me this as a prophetic word about three years ago during my birthday. I've refused to leave that word. He did not give me and say, by next year I should leave it. Every other thing he's saying, I drag this word with it. Let me, let me quote it and then prophesy it over your life. He said, thou shall increase my greatness and comfort me on every side. Now let me declare it over you, that may my God increase your greatness. May my God increase your greatness. May my God increase your greatness. Hallelujah. So don't be surprised when you hear in Koinonia ordinary people being elevated. It's the God that makes great. I was so touched by the testimony of that gentleman. A young man coming and trekking and moving around. And today God has honored him. 
don't tell me it does not matter he said let your light so shine before men that they may see your good deeds i'm praying the next testifier i i release you in the name of jesus into your testimony the next testifier i release you into your testimony Deuteronomy 28 and verse 1 we must present to the world a God that lifts in addition to a God who loves and forgives in addition to a God who heals in addition to a God who redeems and delivers we must present as the end time church if we want to compel the nations to come we must present a God who lifts and honors. Ladies and gentlemen, there are families that are downcast. There are destinies that are downcast. They have never tasted glory. They have never tasted honor. Transgenerationally, from great-grandfather to grandfather to father to the current generation, all that has plagued that generation is shame and reproach. They have wallowed in sin, serving like the men of artists, an unknown God. Now you want them to live Leave what they are doing and come to the Lord Jesus Christ. You must present to them a God who lifts. That God can set you up on high above all the nations of the earth. You see, let me tell you the truth. And I submit to you by the power of the Holy Spirit. Do you know one of the reasons why I travel to these nations to go and minister with joy? Because among the many things that I seek for the people to see, is a living testimony of a lifting Jesus. A living testimony of a lifting Jesus. You can doubt anything you want to doubt in a man, but you cannot argue when God lifts a man. When a politician lifts a man, it depends on whether that, polit that political party is in power. Are we together? But when God lifts you, no. So God helps us as we travel to the nations to not only preach Christ, to not only teach the word, but to inspire a generation that if anybody ever told you is a waste to love Jesus, look at my life as an evidence that he lifts. And I'm saying that to someone while you are seated. If you saw me 15, 20 years ago, I would not look like this. Now are we the sons of God and it does not yet appear. Find hope. The God you are serving, the one you have come to, even the God of Koinonia is the God that lifts. I can tell you, he's not just the God who educates your mind. Every week as you come here, you are encountering not only the forgiving God, not only the healing God, not only the delivering God. Even tonight, you are encountering the God who honors and the God who lifts. To lift you and elevate you. You will hear of many people who will come and tell you, I was an ordinary person, but presidency has called me to do something. Don't say it does not matter. These are signatures of God, revealing himself as a lifting God. I will never forget, and I say this with every sense of humility, years ago when the Lord told me that a day will come, heads of state and presidents and kings will call you. And I believed it blindly, but these are the days when those realities are happening. And I look at my life and say, Lord, be Beyond what you are doing in my life, help a generation know that when you speak, they should take you seriously. <laughs> Hallelujah. I remember one of the things the Lord told me, this will be the first time I'm saying it here. When I was asking him about our building project and whatever, the Lord said that I will make you and I will make my house a praise to the nations. I didn't understand what he was saying, but now it's beginning to piece itself together. Anything you hear, ba. Just say, thank God, but believe it. As what God can do, if it is in this household, just know that there is no miracle that is too big that you say, Kai, is this true? If it is God, you just believe it. He does these things to show the nations that he can be trusted. Did I not tell you that years ago the Lord told me that if you will let men see me, there is nothing I will not give you. God lived so, and I, if I be lifted up from the earth, he says, I will draw men. So when God wants men to come, he will lift you because you are committed to lifting him. Koinonia will not go down, no. 
Joshua Selman will not go down. I, I can tell you that by the Spirit. Because there is a hand. We are not standing on a ladder. We are not standing on a, a casted pole. We are standing on an invisible hand. The height is the size that whatever direction and height that hand lifts you, that's where you stay. And it has pleased him to continue lifting us. And we are praying that in the name of Jesus, he will not find reason to peg our growth. Compared to where God is taking us, this is only a step out of the cave. This is child's play. You wait and see when God is done cleaning. You know how you present an artwork to the nations. And you say, just see, don't touch. They put it and cover it. This is what God is doing. He's bringing glory out of you through the prayer, through the fasting, through the disciplines. When he's done, he will present you to your family, present you to the nations, and they will say, truly, this is what God can do. The God who lifts. Some of you have encountered the God who forgives. Some of you have encountered the God who heals. Some of you have encountered the God who redeems and delivers. But maybe church has taught you that lifting and honor is not part of his benefit. I am telling you now, the end time church that wants to present a complete God that will compel all to come must also reveal the God who honors and who lifts. That one of these days we will stand here and all of us will be crying in Koinonia because somebody will come to testify and say, look at my life and look at how God has lifted me. Lifted me beyond my limitation. Lifted me in spite of my family. Lifted me in spite of my tribe. In spite of my educational qualification. And he has lifted me so that I will become a praise to the nations. I told him, I said, Lord, if for any reason you are looking for someone that you can show the nations as a sample of your handiwork, I am an available vessel. Koinoni, are you learning? The God who lifts. Can I tell you? There are many of you who are seated here. The major issues in your life are centered around honor, lifting, and finding a sense of purpose for your life. You are trusting God for jobs. There are young men who are trusting God to be established. And you, you come for koinonia because you love the Lord. But in truth, you also come because you suspect in your heart that if he's that mighty, then lifting should not be an impossible thing for him to do. And you are right. It should not be a suspicion. It should become a conviction tonight that the God we seek to propose to the nations is a God that lifts. It's a God that lifts. Can he lift a minister of the gospel? Yes. Can he lift a woman? Yes. Can he lift a man? Yes. Can he take the poor from the dunghill and place him in a position of prominence and honor? Yes. Can he lift a Yoruba family? Yes. Can he lift an Igbo family? Can he lift a Middle Beltan family? How about the family of an orphan? Yes. How about a widow? Yes. How about a widower? Yes. How about someone who has lost all his siblings and is alone? Regardless the condition, if it is my God, the one that the Bible talks about, not the one that the narrative of preachers has lopsided, the God that the Bible talks about is a God who honors and a God who lives. Honor me, O God, in this season. Lay your hands on your head and pray that prayer. Honor me for the sake of your kingdom. Lift me for the sake of your kingdom. Go ahead. Don't be afraid. Don't feel guilty for praying that prayer. Your elevation is good for the kingdom. Go ahead and pray. Because my heart is right with you. Lord, do not restrain your hand as far as lifting me is concerned. You are a man of God. Pray this sincere prayer. Let it please you to lift my ministry. Give it honor and visibility before the nations. The God who honors, the God who lifts, the God who honors, both riches and honor come from you. Salika frakasapakatosiata. Koinonia, pray. If the mountain of the Lord's house must be exalted 
and if all nations should flow to it then that house must present a God that honors a God that lifts hallelujah number five someone you just prayed into your next level right now number five what kind of a God must we present to the nations if we want to see the prophecy of Isaiah chapter 2 revealed we want to see the nations flow to it we want to see multitudes rush to Jesus we want to see men give up mundane gods and everything and run to the God of the Bible we must present a God who is interested in the prosperity and overall well-being of the believer the God who is interested in the prosperity and the overall well-being of the believer three serious scriptures one Psalm 35 27 Psalm 35 verse 27 let them shout for joy and be glad that favor my righteous cause yea let them say continually let the Lord be magnified which had prosperity which had pros which had pleasure in the prosperity of his servants first Corinthians 29 11 and 12 first Chronicles 29 11 and 12 can I tell you we are in the apostolic era of the church there is something that God wants to do through the church and a church that is not economically empowered I said this the last time we met that church is going to be weak I submit to you and I don't want to go ahead of myself you see the land the property the property that by the privilege of God's grace do you know you already have an idea these are these are properties running to billions and you want to be able to you are, it takes resources to just quietly pay and not say anything and not go around manipulating people not not tens of millions not hundreds of millions billions it takes resources to keep you as a person of integrity I taught you last week if you do not have financial resources you will steal you will lie you will borrow let's read this together thine O Lord want to go please thine O Lord is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty uh-huh for all that is in heaven and earth is thine thine is the kingdom O Lord and thou art exalted above all verse 12 he said both riches and honor come from thee and thou reignest above all he says and in thy hand is the power and the might and it is in your hand to make great and to give strength all kinds of strength including financial strength can I tell you ladies and gentlemen please hear me I will run to a God who I'm told loves me and can forgive and, and can forgive I will run to a God who I'm told can heal my infirmities I will run to a God who I'm told can deliver me I will run to a God who I'm told can honor and can lift me and I will run to a God who I'm told is also conscious not just of his program that would be a selfish God a God who in spite of the fact that he's conscious of his divine prophetic program is also kind enough to be conscious of my needs it is a lopsided theology to sell a God who is just pushing the saints kingdom advance kingdom advance let souls be won let nations be saved I agree but he's kind and loving enough to see to it that whilst you serve his purposes your needs are met do not exempt that out of your theology. Hallelujah. Psalm 23 verse 1. I have done a whole teaching. You can go and listen to it. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. One more time. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. The last time. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. 
That means if you are in lack and want, it is an indictment on his leadership that he's not responsible enough to see to it that your needs are met. I will preach salvation like that is all there is to preach. I will preach transformation like that is all there is to preach. I will preach every aspect of the kingdom like that that is all to preach. When it's time to preach wealth and abundance, I will preach it as if I do not know any other thing to preach because you must receive the whole counsel of God. Hallelujah. Psalms 34 and verse 10. The young lions do lack and suffer hunger. As responsible, I have watched from not Joe Wild, the pride, you know, the whole, the way that the pride functions. And I can tell you they are quite, lions are quite responsible creatures. They ensure that their youngs as much as possible do not lack. But the Bible says as powerful as they are, they are limited. That the young lions do lack and suffer hunger. He said, but they that seek the Lord. Are there benefits there? They that seek the Lord. He didn't say they shall just be Christians who are preparing for heaven. He says they shall not want any good thing. We have preached a message in the body of Christ and you will hear many of my teachings that relate to what I'm saying. Total surrender. And I will keep preaching it till the day I see his face. Loving Jesus beyond things. Loving Jesus above things. I will never stop preaching it. But in addition to that, I would have lied to you as a man of God if I told you that God only calls you to serve him and forgets about your need. That is not an intelligent presentation. That lopsided presentation is the reason why people have had cause to look at our God as a selfish God. Because to the average believer, it looks like your entire spiritual pursuit is just to serve him, to love him. All your money, give to him. All your wisdom, give to him. Everything. And there is nothing for you. We don't serve God because of things, but there are things we receive as we serve God. We do not serve God just because we want all of these things, but he has so designed it as proof of his love. All that I've told you right now, ladies and gentlemen, the psalmist simply calls them his benefits. Psalm 103. Bless the Lord, verse 1, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. Let me show you the five things that I said now that the church must present to the nations as touching who God is. The psalmist said we should forget not all his benefits. That means as you are blessing the Lord, bless him because you love him, but have this consciousness that serving God pays, that there are benefits to serving the Lord. Benefit number one, verse three. Who forgiveth all thine iniquities. This is the God who forgives. Number two, who healeth all thy diseases. Number three, who redeemeth thy life from destruction. Number four, who crowneth thee with loving kindness and tender mercies. Finally, who satisfieth thy mouth with good things, so that thy youth is renewed like an eagle. This is the God that the end time church must present to the nations. <laughs> present this God to a businessman. He will respond the same way a poor man will respond. If he does not need the God who lives because he is already prosperous, he will soon need the God who heals. Present this to someone who may be an intellectual but bound in a family with witchcraft and you will need the God who delivers provided you are on earth you will need one of these five dimensions of God the one who loves you enough to have given his son who forgives the one who heals all of our diseases and infirmities the one who delivers us from destruction the one who crowns us with loving kindness and tender mercies, bringing honors and liftings of all sorts to our lives. And then the one who satisfied your mouth. I will never serve God and beg for bread. No. 
I, I reject that theology. It will never be part of my life. It is not because begging for bread is necessarily, I don't have a problem with it. It's just that it is not the will of God and it is wrong. It is a misrepresentation of the God who called me. I don't know the one who saved you, but the one who saved me as revealed from scripture is careful and loving to see that eventually my life becomes a holistic capture of his forgiveness, his healing, his deliverance, deliverance, his lifting, and his prosperity. You present such a God to the world, and I can tell you the nations will run and come to him. Africa is the most religious continent, and Africa has been gifted by God. This is a nation that is literally sitting on eternal treasures, that even if all the dispensations from the time that the world began till now. All the minerals and everything is explored. We will not be able to exhaust it, but we're impoverished. Today, psychologists and philosophers have coined the Christian faith in addition to all other religion. I don't want to mention their names. You've studied about them in history. They have coined religion to be a source of consolation for masses and weak and beggarly people. You see, one time I had the privilege of speaking with some diplomats. They were actually U.S. diplomats and we were having a discussion. And they were asking me about my perspective as to why Africa, in spite of the fact that it is a very religious continent, it seemed to not make the kind of progress. And I said, no, the problem is not God. The first problem is we ministers of the gospel and the kind of Christianity that is being sold in Africa. On one hand, we have a Christianity that is built on materialism and just carnal comfort as the total basis for serving God. But on another hand, we have a theology that teaches a false dimension of holiness, extracting these other dimensions of God's benefit. Both of them are stretches of imbalance. You cannot mentor a people and build a theology that is based on carnality and materialism. Can I tell you, if God never gives me any of these things, I still love him and I will serve him all my life. You see that now? Yes. Before all of those things came, we still loved him. And even in the midst of all of these things, we will still love him. I will never sell the idea of a God to a people who is just out to just give you tea and bread and that is all. No, God has an agenda. We must love him beyond the things of this world. The lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, the pride of life and everything the world can give. Because if you teach a God that only satisfies the carnal needs of people, you will produce a weak, materialistic, self-centered group of believers. But on another hand, if in a bid to balance carnality and materialism, you now sell an idea of a God who seems to be a selfish God, who is angry and will judge you. If you don't serve him, he will waste your life. You cannot call such a God love. No. I will serve a God who loved me before I even knew myself. I will serve a God who died for me before I even knew I was a sinner. Are we together? I will serve a God who has chosen to love and forgive me. I will serve a God who has made healing and health available for me. I will serve a God who has afforded me the opportunity to be free from yokes and curses and satanic things. I will serve a God who has chosen to lift and honor in ever increasing dimensions. And I will serve a God who has pleased him to place something in my hand for my needs and to be able to be a blessing to the nations. Hallelujah. This is the God that we serve. I will love him for who he is. And I will serve him in spite of these things. But because he has brought these things as benefits, consolations to my Christian experience, I will not reject them. So for those of you who have been rejecting this, our prayer point tonight is to look at these five areas. Which one have you rejected through religion? You must embrace everything now. There are some of you, God would have prospered you by far before now. But maybe based on your theological training, you have been 
you have received the proposal of a God who does not care about your well-being. Now your children are grown, you love the Lord, but their school fees cannot be paid. Your rent is a big thorn in your flesh. You are about to tell lies, you are about to steal, whereas there is provision for you in Zion. And your life continues to misrepresent the love of this God. Anybody who learns God through the lens of your life will only see a lopsided God. For many of us, we have marketed a very selfish God. If unbelievers were to interpret their knowledge of God from the lens of our lives, it looks like God has just called us into the burdensome ministry of serving him till we die serving him with no privilege that is worse, only baiting us with some kind of thing that in heaven one day he will bless you. That's not the Jesus that we have come to show the world. In this life, there are benefits. And even in the world to come, there is an eternal reward. That even when we get to heaven, getting to heaven is not just a reward. There are crowns, there are gifts that are given to people on account of their committal and their service. Koinonia, global, the nations of the earth. For one last time before we pray, this is the end time church. The mountain of the Lord's house that was being exalted above all the nations of the earth. And in this apostolic era of the church where there's revival sweeping across the nations, I'm speaking to myself, to you as my precious people, to fellow servants, ministers of the gospel. It is important that we represent Jesus. Because there is something faulty with our presentation of Jesus. It has not been a holistic capture of who he really is. It is the reason why, according to the parable of Jesus, there are a group of people who keep rejecting Jesus. Notice from that parable, there are weak, beggarly, blind people. These are largely the groups of people who are coming to Jesus. And they are largely coming because of their needs. But the Bible is telling us, based on the instruction of Jesus, that Jesus has mandated us to go to the highways and the byways and to compel all not just blind people, all, all men, all nations, all kingdoms, all races. And we will only do that if we present a loving and forgiving Jesus, a healing Jesus, a delivering Jesus. Are we together now? A Jesus and God Almighty that lifts and honors and the one who can satisfy your mouth with good things. When they come, then we can now disciple them. The assignment of all these tools is to attract them, to bring them to the house of the Lord. The Bible says when they now come, they will say, teach us his ways. He will teach us. We will now begin to mentor them and show them other aspects of the kingdom. You don't mentor and teach a people who are afar from the Lord. The assignment of all that I've mentioned is as a, a double-edged sword of our evangelism to bring them to Jesus. When they now come, and they are planted, we can now disciple them. In my lifetime, I believe, before we see his face, we will see the manifestation of this prophetic word. God has shown me in my visions, and I stand in faith with every true man of God. We stand as a generation and even as Nigeria, God's, right now, God has placed lavish grace upon our nation. We are importing like solid minerals the gospel and a portrait of a living Christ to the nations. It has so pleased the Lord to lavishly bestow grace upon us. We must not waste that opportunity. The nations are willing to see Jesus. Kenya, we are coming. This is the Jesus we are taking to Kenya. This is the one we are taking to South Africa. This is the one we are taking to America. This is the God we are taking to Canada. This is the God we are taking to Europe. This is the God that we are bring, we reintroducing to Africans. So when you bring your idol, place him here. I place my Lord Jesus Christ. Does your idol forgive sins? Prove it. Does your idol heal the sick? Prove it. Does your idol deliver from the oppressed? From oppression? Prove it. Does your idol lift? Does your idol satisfy the mouth of people? Look at the quality of life of the Habalis involved in it. And you can contrast and then tell the nations, come to Jesus. And they will come sincerely 
Number one, because they love him, but because they have seen through the lens of his benefits that indeed he's a good God. Ladies and gentlemen, our fathers did not fail in presenting Jesus. Some of them made mistakes and presented a lopsided God to the nations. Sincerely so, but it was a mistake. And the state of the church today in many nations is a reflection of the mistake in perspective of those who sold the idea of Jesus to them. There are nations who territorially rejected a God who lives. There are nations who territorially rejected a God who heals. They said the era of signs and wonders ended with the apostles and many who should not die have died today. God has now brought us as sons to be respectful corrections of the mistakes of the fathers. But we must do it with humility and grace. I say it again. There is a mandate upon my life. There is a mandate upon your life. There is a mandate upon koinonia to represent the God that the nations will come to. The Bible calls him the God of Jacob. When we present this God, can I tell you, there will be no empty pews. People will come week in and week out. The thousands of people who are gathered here right to the overflows, the thousands of others who are now connecting online, they are not just coming because they like the man who is preaching, that may be wonderful, but they are coming because by the privilege of God's grace, we have made our minds with the intelligence of an artist to capture every necessary dimension that should be found in the Jesus we present to the nations. And so when you are looking for a forgiving Jesus, you will find him in Koinonia. When you are looking for a healing Jesus, you will find him in Koinonia. When you are looking for a delivering Jesus, you will find him in Koinonia. When you are looking for the lifter of men, the one who gives favor and visibility, you will find him in Koinonia. When you are looking for the one who is attentive to satisfy the hunger of people, for God's sake, you will find him in Koinonia. And if there is any other dimension we have failed to capture, may it also be found in our midst. Amen. In the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Rise up on your feet. I'd like you to participate in this two or three minutes of prayer. Please, discipline yourself to participate in this prayer. It is not just the nations that need that dimension of Jesus. The first prayer is you are going to pray for yourself. Father, let the forgiving Jesus, the healing Jesus, the redeeming and delivering Jesus, the lifting Jesus, and the one who prospers, let him be at work in my life. I surrender my life and my days to this holistic dimension of God. Lift your voice and begin to pray. And for the nations following across the globe, make sure you pray. We are dealing with the mountain of the Lord's house, revealing the biblical portrait of what the end time church should be. Correcting the misrepresentations of God that has brought pungency to the gospel as far as attracting the saints and attracting men to Jesus is concerned. He gave us a mandate we must not fail to obey. He said, go to the highways and the byways. And he said, compel them to come. Koinonia, pray. Father, you are glorifying yourself in this ministry. May I not be exempted. Go ahead and pray. Let me love you more than things. Let me love you more than healing. Let me love you more than deliverance. Let me love you more than lifting. Let me love you more than influence, more than favor, more than wisdom. But Lord, I decree and declare that as I love you, as I live for you, and as I serve you, in the name of Jesus, may my life be a capture of a loving and forgiving Jesus. May my life be a capture of a healing Jesus. May my life be a capture of a redeeming and delivering Jesus. May my life be a capture of the God that he, that honors, the God that lifts, and may my life be a capture of the God that satisfies my mouth with good things. Let my children not cry as I serve you. Let my needs be met as I serve you. Let it please you to lift me as I serve you. Let every infirmity in my body die as I serve you. Let my days be lengthened 
and fulfilled as I serve you. In the name of Jesus, to the sinner, he is the God who loves and forgives. Forgives those who are broken and forgives those who are contrite. Forgives those who are repentant. To the sick, he reveals himself as the God who heals and that he heals all diseases even to the uttermost. To the ones bound and oppressed and kept in their lowly estate, under the influence of all kinds of demonic forces, he is the God who delivers and truly he delivers. That who, who the Son of Man sets free is free indeed. To the one who has been bound by mediocrity as an individual, as an institution, as a family, that he's able to raise you from the dunghill and bring honor to you, honor to the name of your family, that for once they will trace the lineage of your family and find a point where you encounter the God of heaven and that he decided to lift you. And to the one who is poor and needy with all kinds of pain and financial problems, house rent, children's school fees, bills that are already drifting you towards the corridors of compromise. You can't pray because of these things. You're a man of God. You now want to start lying and faking miracles because of pressure. You want to start stage managing things, not because you're a bad person, but that is what financial incapacitation can do, can do to you. And has done to many, in fact. There are many people have had the honor of speaking with them. And they're saying, Apostle, I'm not a bad person, but pressure has pushed me into things that should not be. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and forget not his benefits. Present this God, present this Jesus to your world, and you will see the rich run with tears in their eyes and come to a loving, a forgiving, and a healing God. You will see the poor come crying and say, Lord, I have given myself to idols in a bid to look for lifting. For God's sake, if you can make a vessel out of me, then please go ahead and do so. We will see the world and the nations run to Jesus. And this is what we are here for. And I'm praying that in our lifetime, that in the name of Jesus, we will be able to present this portrait of God and this portrait of Jesus to the nations.